All right, 2 Kings chapter 20. This is the, the third chapter, actually, that's going over the reign of Hezekiah. So we had chapters 18, 19, and 20 are all going over stories that have to do with King Hezekiah. And if you remember in chapter 18, the Bible referred to um, King Hezekiah as being someone that, in verse 5, it says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. King Hezekiah is a great king. He has three chapters just in the book of 2 Kings alone dedicated you know, to him and what he did. Great man of God, great hero of the faith, someone to be looked up to, but just like every hero of the Bible, he is not perfect. And we're going to see here some of his flaws in 2 Kings chapter 20 and some of the things that he did wrong and some of his sins that he had. And, you know, just like David, you know, David had some real serious sins. King Hezekiah has some pretty serious sins too. But what, what sets these men apart and why God gives them such, um, you know, allows them to have su such honor in the word of God is because of their attitude to serve God. Is because they trusted in the Lord. Because they sought the Lord with all their heart. And they, ha they maintained a humble spirit that even though sometimes they may get lifted up with pride and they may get into sin and even some really bad sins, at the end of the day, they repent, they get right with God and, and are, you know, continue to look to God for everything and have faith in Him and rely on Him at the end of the day. Now, there's, obviously, there's, there's times in between where they may have some rough spots where they, you know, they're not as good in that area, but ultimately, these are men that will always come back and humble themselves and get right with God. And this is you know, one of the great attitudes that, that Hezekiah has and that we ought to have and model ourselves after. And we need to remember that, you know, no matter what sins you may have done in your past, just if you have a, a proper contrite spirit and you're willing to just, just be sorrowful for your sin, move past that and, and continue to seek to serve the Lord without getting too high and mighty and proud, in yourself, that is the attitude that we need to have, and God can use you and continue to use you beyond that. Now, we're going to get into this chapter here, and one of the things that I just want to make sure that we remember and kind of glean from this chapter is that, you know, every man needs to take heed lest you fall. Hezekiah was, has, has already been, um, has many, had many victories, done many great things for God, and in this chapter, we're going to see where he gets lifted up with pride, and then God has to bring him low. And God has to bring judgment because he got lifted up with pride. Now, we also see him repent, which is good. And we're going to get to that a little bit later. But we need to keep this always in the forefront of our mind that we don't get lifted up with pride, that we can take heed to ourselves, take heed to God's word, stay humble, and stay in the house of the Lord. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. So Hezekiah is, is, is really sick, right? And Isaiah comes to him and tells him, okay, it's time to get prepared. And this is literally the word of the Lord. Isaiah is bringing him the word of God saying, you know what? It's your time to die now. So get everything straightened up because you're not going to make it through this, through this disease or through, you know, through this illness, whatever it is that he was specifically suffering from, the sickness that he had. He was sick unto death. And, you know, obviously it's not good news to hear, you know, when you, a doctor comes to you and says, you know, and this isn't the doctor, this is Isaiah, but, you know, if, if someone will come to you and say, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're going to die soon, you better get things ready and be prepared. Here's how he responds, verse number two, in a way that I think many of us would probably want to respond. Uh, he says, then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. And see, here we see him, again, relying on God. Right? He hears this news and he prays unto God, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. He was real sad about this. He was grieved that, that his life was going to end. And he entreats God and he goes to God and just says, God, look. You know the good things and the works that I've done in this life. And he's, he's asking for mercy from God. Now, Hezekiah is all right, the narrator of the Bible. We just read that. That's why I went back to 2 Kings 18, verse 5, to
to show you that it's not just that he had this own, you know, this, this, this high attitude of himself and, you know, with the way that he stood with God. God had that attitude about him. God knew that he was a righteous king. God knew that he did a lot of things and he had a good heart and God praises him in his word through the narrator of the Bible, not just through Hezekiah's own words. So this is something that, that he realized. And look, you know, when you're walking right with God, when you're living a pretty righteous life, you know that you're doing right by God. It's not something that, you know, you know other people might want to make it, oh, you're so proud and arrogant. No, I mean, if you're, we know we're not perfect. He wasn't claiming to be without sin. But he knew, he's like, hey, I'm following the Lord. I've got a heart to serve God. I'm doing as much as I can to serve him, right? And if you're doing the same thing, you should be able to say the same thing. And we want to be in the position that Hezekiah was in so that if something bad is going to happen, or if, we, if we have really bad news, we can entreat the Lord for mercy and say, hey, God, you know all the stuff that I've, did for, I've done for you. Can, you. can you show me some mercy here and help me out? And that's what a prayer is. You're asking God for things. And we shouldn't be afraid or ashamed to go to God and to ask him for stuff that we need in our life, especially when there's a major problem. I mean, you might get diagnosed one day with cancer or something that's going to be, you know what, this is a life-ending disease. This is a sickness unto death. But you can go to God, and, and that's the best position to be in. You know, go to God no matter what, but if you've been living a life that's been upstanding and, and righteous in his eyes, this is the position you want to be in to go and ask God for things. The same way that the best position for my kids to be in if they want to ask dad for something to help them with something for some type of a blessing is when they are living right under my rules, when they're not being disobedient, when they're listening to what I say, when they're doing the things I tell them to do. That is the best position to be in. And that was the position that Hezekiah is in. And look at what happens here. And it came to pass, verse number four, and it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him. So God answers him. Before Isaiah even gets a chance to leave, he said before he's even gone out into the middle court. He hasn't even made it that far and God answers him. Hezekiah asks God, you know, just, just God, remember the good things I've done. Before Isaiah, he's turned around, he's not even left yet, and he's like, God answers him. Saying, verse 5, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will heal thee. God answers his prayers. He heals him. And look, Hezekiah doesn't, when he hears this, he doesn't go run to the doctor to say, you know, oh, I need to be healed of this. You know, I'm going to die from this. What's the first thing he goes? He goes, he goes to God. And that's what we ought to do too. Now, look, I'm not against physicians. I'm not against seeing a doctor. But the first place we always need to be going to is going to God, praying to God, and be in a position where God is going to be a lot more likely to receive your prayers and answer your prayers. He'll hear you if you're his child, but you need to be, you know, when we're doing good and doing what's right and pleasing in his sight and we're listening to him already, he's much more inclined to listen to you and to hear your prayers and to heal you. In this case, he's healing him. And then I, I love this because he says, behold, I will heal thee on the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I believe that's a foreshadowing of, you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ coming up out of hell, being healed in a sense, if you will, because he's coming out of corruption, he's coming out of, uh, out of the pit of hell and, and going up unto the house of the Lord, and, you know, ascending up unto heaven. Um, that's just a, a very small foreshadowing. But obviously what, what literally happened here is that, you know, God heals him and then um, because of his uncleanness from the sickness is when he would need, you know, he's saying, okay, wait three days and then go up unto the house of the Lord, which is I'm understanding to be, you know, his, his purification and things like that to go unto the house of the Lord. And um, verse number six, he says, and I will add unto thy days 15 years. So God gives him another 15 years to live. And he tells him, he's going to get a whole 15 years. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And Isaiah said, take a lump of figs and they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. So, of course, God keeps his promise. I mean, that, that goes without saying. Verse number eight, And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me? Now, understand, you know, when, when the Bible's telling stories and giving us information, 
it gets to a natural stopping point and then sometimes will go back and give us more information of what, you know, of what was being said or whatever during. So what, what this is saying is that, you know, God gave him 15 years and the healing took place by Isaiah um, taking a lump of figs and putting it on the boil in order to recover. But see, now it kind of, and it tells us that he did recover from that. And everything happened the way God said. But then we jump back just really a little bit in time from that because it gives you the, the end result of what happened and then goes back to Isaiah, Hezekiah saying unto Isaiah from that conversation, right, of um, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal him because he's not healed yet. So obviously we're going backwards in time just a little bit to show uh, as part of this conversation. Or what really, the, verse 7 kind of gives you the end of it even though we're in the midst of this conversation between Hezekiah and Isaiah. What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up unto the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? Now, what, what I love about this, and you, you're going to see something really cool here in just a second, but, um, and actually turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter number 7. Isaiah 7. Keep your finger here. We're gonna, I'm still going to read a few more verses, but get your place ready in Isaiah 7. He's asking for a sign. He's saying, well, what, how am I going to know for sure that God's going to heal me? And this doesn't offend God. At this point, he, he says, Isaiah says, okay, here's going to be your sign. He says, this sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? Now, when it's talking about a shadow going forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees, it's talking about telling time. So, and we see the sundial referenced here, but when the sun is moving, right, or the earth is moving and the, and the, the sun is, is telling the time, what he's, what he's saying is, the shadow of whatever time it is going backwards or going forwards. That's what he's talking about. And so by 10 degrees, you know, I don't, I don't know how much 10, 10 degrees is um, in minutes. Doesn't matter, right? However many minutes. It's not, it's not that much, but it's still significant enough. Let's say it's five minutes just for sake of argument. I know it's not right, but I'm just saying. Let's, let's say it's five minutes. And, well, you can make the, the shadow go five degree forward or five degree backwards or 10, you know, um, excuse me, 10 degrees. And he says, it's not that big of a deal, basically. He says, uh, Hezekiah answers him because he says, well, do I go forwards or backwards? Either way, God can do it. And Hezekiah answered, is a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees? Nay, but let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. So what he's saying is that it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a miracle. It's not that big of a sign for the shadow to, to fast forward 10 degrees, right? For everything to continue the way it normally does clockwise. He's saying, let's make it go backwards. And this is an incredible miracle that God does here. And, you know, I, don't, I really don't want to get into the whole flat earth garbage and other nonsense. But people want to point to miracles like this and say, see, in order for this to happen on your ball earth, then God would have had to make the whole earth stop and spin the other way. And, you know, then you know, people would be falling down and there'd be so much chaos and everything else. They say the same thing about the miracles where God had this, uh, you know, where Joshua said, you know, commanded the sun to stand still so he could finish the battle and then it stood still and then, <coughs> and then it continued on again, you know, kind of stopping time. But what, what people don't realize is that this is a miracle. No matter what system you believe in, something's going to get screwed up. Because everything works together. All of the motion of the heavens and the earth all work, you know, in a synthesis together with one another that, that impact everything that happens in this life. So like the, those, whether the, the sun stands still or the sun dial goes back, you know, the shadow goes back 10 degrees. This is an incredible miracle. Now look, Why would you assume that all God is capable of doing and say, well, wouldn't people all be falling down and you have all this chaos and stuff? So you think God's not capable of making that happen without having disasters? Like, is God bound by the laws of nature? 
He can't be in order to even do that to begin with. So this is what's stupid. You can't, you can't use a miracle as evidence of those. See, you know, that could, we can't be living, on, you know, the earth can't be spinning because if he were to do that, then you'd have all these other problems. Well, no, I mean, if you were to make the earth stop and spin backwards, you would have all those problems. But God doesn't have that problem because God spake everything into existence. And God's capable of handling any repercussions that might happen in the system that he controls. Anyways, God is in charge of the heavens and the earth and everything that happens. He's able to, to, to make things work the way that he wants it to because he's all powerful. That's not that difficult of a concept to understand. But I, I, I mean, this is such an amazing, you know, it's kind of like, no one would even probably think about this but God because God gave Isaiah the, the, you know, the, the option. Well, what sign do you want? Do you want, do you want me to change time forward or backward? Do I go forward or rever reverse? And he chose reverse. And now look at this because this is important. Look at verse number 11. And Isaiah, the prophet, cried unto the Lord and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Now, the reason why this is important, it says the dial of Ahaz. Flip, if you would, to Isaiah 7, where I had you turn to. Do you remember King Ahaz? Because that's who this was referring to. From, I think, oh, what chapter was, did we read about him in? 12, maybe? I don't remember. In 2 Kings, we talk about, I believe it was chapter 12. I'm not positive about that. When we were reading about Ahaz, but in Isaiah chapter 7, see, Isaiah, Ahaz was confronted with asking a sign of God to show that God was going to deliver Israel with, uh, through Elisha. You remember? And it was like he, when he was telling, and different kings had their experiences with, you know, these prophets coming to him at various times and saying, okay, you know, smacked the, the arrows down on the ground and he, you know, he did it three times and stayed and, and that was going to be a result of, of, of um, how God was going to bless him or, or, or use him or whatever. And here we have the dial of Ahaz is literally what's being used to show this great miracle, this sign that was asked for and God completed. Isaiah 7, look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, Moreover the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. It is not a coincidence that we're talking about the dial of Ahaz here. Ask the sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. God wants there to be, in these situations, for there to be a sign because God gets the glory from these miracles that happen. God wants them to say, you know what? Try me out. Ask me a sign. I'm going to do something big. Go ahead and ask me whatever, in the, in the height above, the depth, beneath, whatever it is. Nothing's too big for me. I'll give you the sign. But what was Ahaz's response? But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Oh, I'm not going to test you, God. I'm not going to ask for a sign. God said, give me, you know, sh give me a sign. Ask me a sign. And he said, hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will ye weary my God also? He's saying, you're not, you're not going to weary me. And then he goes on to say that the sign he's going to give is a virgin shall conceive and give birth. And um, which, again, talk about a, a great miracle. But God was looking for him to ask something big, to do something that only God can do, to do something that's going to bring honor and glory unto his name and magnify the power of God. Ahaz didn't do that. Hezekiah, he wasn't afraid at all. He's like, you know what? It's too easy to go forward a little bit. Let's go backwards. Let's do a real, like the, the, the hardest thing possible for, your, for the sign. Let's go backwards. And that's what he did. And that's why it says, by which he had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. So it's bringing up that, that connection between Ahaz not asking for a sign, not wanting to weary the Lord with, with, with a miracle. Whereas Hezekiah is like, yeah, let's see, let's see it, God, you know. Let's see a great miracle from you because he loves the Lord and he wants to bring more glory to his name. So I thought that was pretty cool. It's, it's interesting how it, it specifically mentions the dial of Ahaz. Let's go, uh, you're in Isaiah 7, go forward to Isaiah 38. Because we're going to see now a little bit 
into Hezekiah's mind when he was told to get his house in order and his whole healing and stuff, because that's where we're at in 2 Kings. When we get back to chapter 20, we're going to move on from, from this portion of Scripture where he gets healed. Isaiah 38 gives us a little bit of insight into what, you know, Hezekiah's attitude and everything else. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness, I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. So he's thinking that he's missing out, right? So I don't know... Um, I didn't research it to see if I could figure out exactly how old Hezekiah was at this point or, you know, w after the 15 years that he received. But basically saying, you know, he lived a certain amount of years. Let's say he lived to be like 50 years old or something, but he doesn't have the residue of his years. 60 years old, right? He might have lived about that long. And maybe you can figure it out. I didn't, I just, I didn't think to do it for the sermon. And I don't know it off the top of my head. But um, he's saying the residue of my years have been cut off. Right? I'm about to die now. I'm not going to get my golden years. I'm not going to have my, my end years to live out because I'm going to die. Verse 11 says, I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living. And again, you know, I, some people might turn to this to try to justify soul sleep or, you know, not being, con you know, whatever the, the weird doctrines are out there. But he says, when he says, I shall not see the Lord, he clarifies saying, even the Lord in the land of the living, like because he's going to die, right? This is the land of the living right now, is what he's referring to, people who are alive and not dead in the grave, not talking about spiritually, just physically. Um, I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world, right? Again, referring to just being uh, alive on this earth. Verse 12, mine age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off I, I have cut off like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness from day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. I reckoned till morning that as a lion so will he break all my bones from day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. Like a crane or a swallow so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove mine eyes fail with looking upward. O Lord, I am oppressed undertake for me and this is this is the the you know the fear and the sorrow and the you know the things that have come over him knowing that his time is almost up and he's just he's entreating the lord you know i'm oppressed and undertake for me verse 15 what shall i say he hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it i shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul O lord by these things men live and in all these things is the life of my spirit so wilt thou recover me and make me to live. Verse 17, and again, just to prove that the earlier verse talking about I shall not see the Lord is not talking about being saved. It's not talking about I'm going to heaven. It's just talking about being alive on this earth. He says in verse 17, Behold, for, my peace, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast Cast all my sins behind thy back. What a great verse here just on the Old Testament understanding of salvation and that people have been saved the, the same way all throughout history and that we re they received forgiveness of sins the same way we receive forgiveness of sins today and that that forgiveness is a permanent separation where he says that you have delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, which is referring to hell, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. He knows he's forgiven. All of his sins, they're cast behind his back. He knows that. It's done. And it's the same way for every believer today. This is a point we're trying to get across to that one lady. We're out soul winning today to explain that, look, once Jesus has paid for your sins, once you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God casts all of your sins behind his back. He separates you from your sin as far as the east is from the west. He remembers your sin no more. How could that be possible if we could lose our salvation? Those verses wouldn't even make sense. I'm not going to remember your sins anymore because you believe. Oh, wait, now I'm going to remember them again. But wait, you said you're not going to remember them anymore. God's not a liar. If he says he's either going to remember them no more or he will remember them. One or the other. You can't have it both ways. And once you get saved, he's, you, he remembers your sins no more. 
Thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. What a great verse. Verse number 18. For the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. Again, showing that once a person goes to hell, there's no hope. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. That's it. It's done. It's over. It's permanent. There is no purgatory. There is no, no Baptist purgatory of spending a thousand years in hell until the millennial reign of Christ is over. No. They that go down in the pit have no hope. Verse number 19. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Praise God. You know, and this is something that goes to singing. Everybody ought to be singing in the house of the Lord. If you're saved, if God has saved your soul, that is reason to rejoice. And, you know, I know as much as anybody does, I used to be real shy. I used to go to church and not want to sing. And I would just read the words. And I never wanted to sing out even after I was saved and not, not sing. I felt uncomfortable. I didn't think I could sing very good. And I just didn't really like it that much. But you know what? The Bible says here, the Lord was ready to save me. And therefore, which means for this reason, because God was ready to save me, we will sing, not I, we, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Everybody ought to be singing. Everybody ought to be praising the Lord with the hymns because you know why? It's not about you. It's not about the person next to you. It's about praising God. Are you happy about your salvation? Are you happy God saved your soul? Then we ought to express that through singing praise in the house of the Lord unto our God. And for those people who think, oh, I don't need to go to church, what about praising God in the house of the Lord? Read the book of Psalms, why don't you, and talk about praising the Lord. It's not just, you know, you could praise the Lord at your house. You could praise the Lord at someone else's house. But what about praising the Lord in the house of the Lord? You're missing out on that. You people watching sermons on the internet and not getting yourself in church, how are you going to sing praises in the midst of the congregation, are you going to praise God? How are you going to do that? You have to, you could only do that by being in a congregation and being in a church. And God is worthy of that praise, and that's how God wants to be praised. I'm not saying don't praise Him at home. I'm not saying don't do it anywhere else. I'm just saying there are many places in the Bible where this specifically talks about praising God in the midst of the congregation and in the house of the Lord. Your house is not the house of the Lord unless that's where your whole congregation is gathering. Then it could be. But it's referring to the congregation. It's referring to where we gather together, being the house of the Lord and praising God that way. Um, go back, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter number 20. That's just a little bit of insight that we get from Isaiah 38 about Hezekiah, you know, and, and his extreme sorrow and grief, then, then the joy that he received when he found out that he was going to be healed. And, and how happy he was from that. And, um, you know, of course, rejoicing and, and wanting to sing songs. Unto God, 2 Kings chapter 20, look at verse number 12. The Bible says at that time, now we're kind of shift gears a little bit in the story. He's, he's just been healed. And God promised, he says, you know what? I've healed you. You've got 15 years and I'm going to defend Judah and, and, you know, the Syrians aren't going aren't to get you. And he promised to defend them. Verse 12, At that time, Baradak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. So up to this point, remember, we know what's going to happen. We know Babylon's going to come and take over, and they're going to be this, this great kingdom, and they're going to take the children of Judah captive. We know what's going to happen. But up to this point, their enemies have been the Assyrians, not Babylon. So they haven't had any really dealings with Babylon at this point. The king of Babylon hears what happened as a guy. He hears that he was sick unto death. He was real sick. And also at this point, what we have to remember is that, remember last week, God decimated the Assyrian army. It was like 185,000 men. Remember that, that died overnight when they came against Judah? So, this got 
Hezekiah famous in the world because, and, and then right after that, the king of Assyria died, right? His sons killed him. And, and that's a big event. Assyria was taking everybody over. They were conquering and conquering and conquering and defeating nation after nation after nation, but could not defeat Judah because God stepped in. God intervened and made sure that they would not kill him and because they, they blasphemed the God of heaven. So God saved Judah. And as a result now, the king of Babylon, he knows about this. He's heard about this. So now he's sending gifts, he's sending a present, whereas he probably wouldn't even care to have anything to do with them. But as a result of that, he's saying, oh, well, we're going to send Hezekiah a present. We heard he's been sick, you know, kind of buttering up to him a little bit, but also with some ulterior motives, as we'll see in a minute. Verse number 13, and Hezekiah hearkened unto them. So he sends them a present because he heard he'd been sick. But then look at this in verse 13. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them. It means he listened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. So in order for him to listen unto Babylon, it means they were asking him to see all his stuff. Oh, show us your great riches. Show us your great power and your might and, and your riches and, and show everything to us, right? And then lifting him up, and he's lifted up himself and said, I'll show you everything. I'll show you our, the glory of Judah and the glory of Hezekiah. And this is where Hezekiah gets li just lifted up with pride. And we're going to see a few more references to this. We're going to keep reading in 2 Kings 20, but also if you want to get ready, get ahead a little bit, we're going to also look at 2 Chronicles chapter 32 to give us a little bit more insight into this. Look at verse number 14. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, all the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, thy days come, that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, if you're only getting this story from the perspective of 2 Kings chapter 20, you might be scratching your head a little bit and saying, well, what's the big deal? Right? Why, why is this such a big deal that, you know, they sent a gift unto Hezekiah because he was sick, right? So what? And then he shows them all of his stuff. You know, is that really a big deal? It is, because as a result of this, this is why God's saying, no, you know, you are going to lose everything. You're going to go into captivity. They're going to steal everything. Now, there's a lot of things you could learn from this. And before I get into what I believe is still even the, the primary, and we look at some of the other evidence as to why this was a big deal for Hezekiah, it's just a piece of wisdom. When you have valuables, when you have things that, that mean a lot to you, I mean, just money or wealth or anything like that, it is not a good idea to just start broadcasting that to the world or anybody who asks you. No one needs to know how many guns you have in your house. No one needs to know the gold or silver or other treasures that you might have laid up and say, like, oh man, look at my vault. Look at my storehouse. Look at all the stuff that I have here just to show off to them because you know what? People who want to, or are thieves, want to steal, they love for that to happen. There's no reason to broadcast that stuff. I mean, this is why, you know, people, especially early on, and I'm sure it still happens, but early on in the days of social media, like Facebook, you know, people want to brag about them going on these vacations. Oh, we're going here, and they're taking pictures of everything, and you're broadcasting to the world that you're not at home. Hey, my home is left completely unattended, everybody. Look. The door's wide open. Nobody's there. Go ahead and take whatever you want. Obviously, it's not what you're saying, but when you just broadcast everything, 
That's what you're doing because there's wicked people out there. Hezekiah never should have opened up the doors to all of his riches and wealth and show, hey, Babylon, did you need a reason to come over here and fight us and steal from us? Because look at all the wealth that we have. It's all here for the taking. You come with a strong enough army, you could, it's all yours. You could take it. But no, why, why do people even show it off to begin with? It's because they're showing off. It's because they have pride. And that is the real problem. And that is the real problem that God, you know, he was foolish just to show it to people to begin with. Why are you showing all these riches and all these goods? Is that what it's all about? Because he wasn't apparently giving the glory unto God either. You know, God, what he was humble and went to God and said, God, please save me. God saved him from in the battle. God saved his health and gave him 15 more years. But now what we're seeing happen, and we're going to see a little bit more evidence for this, is that he is taking the glory for himself. And he is getting himself lifted up with pride. I mean, think about it. And, and this is also what you need to be aware of and, and watch out for is when God does lift you up out of a really bad situation that you don't let yourself then get lifted up as if <coughs> it's because you're this great person and, and kind of get a big head of it yourself. Right? Because it's easy, it's easy to do. God steps in in a miraculous way and, and, and blesses you and gives you great things. Stop it, Elizabeth. Sit down right now. And gives you all these great things. And then you turn around and think that, oh, it's because, you know, I'm, I'm God's favorite. And you start thinking, you know, whatever it is that you might be thinking, that's going to lift up your own pride and, and, and think that it's because you're so great, as opposed to just being humble and thankful to God. You know, you don't need to show everything off. Uh, 2 Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 32, look at verse number 23. Verse number 23. And many brought gifts unto the Lord to Jerusalem and presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was magnified in the sight of all nations from thenceforth. Now, I believe that the he was magnified is referring to Hezekiah, not necessarily to the Lord, that Hezekiah was magnified in the sight of the nations. Now, God is the one, and, and you know, thank God, some people brought gifts unto the Lord because they recognized that the Lord was winning the victory. And this is in reference to the great victory over the king of Assyria, is what the, in, in 2 Chronicles, I know we didn't get too far in context, but in the context here of this verse, it's referring to them having the victory over the king of Assyria. So people are bringing gifts unto the Lord, but then they're also bringing gifts unto Hezekiah, right? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but as a result then of this victory, Hezekiah is magnified in the sight of the nations from thenceforth. Verse 24, which is why Babylon came to give gifts. Verse 24, in those days Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord and he spake unto him and gave him a sign. Verse 25, but Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. So he didn't give back the glory to God. He didn't render to God. You know, God gave unto him, but then he didn't, you know, give God his due. He wasn't giving God the credit and the glory. And it says, for his heart was lifted up. So 2 Chronicles 32 gives us a little bit more insight showing us, yeah, Hezekiah was lifted up with pride. And that's the reason why, God, you know, Isaiah comes to him then and says, hey, you know, what did you show him? Oh, I showed him everything. Okay, well, as a result now, you're going to lose everything everything's going to be taken and you're going to go into captivity. And, it's, and that's what, and so I'll read 2 Chronicles 32, 25 in full. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. That's why. That's why it was so bad. This gives us the full meaning in the context that it wasn't just because, hey, my buddy came over and I showed him this, you know, this, this cool stuff I have. It was, he was lifted up with pride and he wasn't rendering to God the glory. The Lord's the one that lifts people up and the Lord brings people down and that's evident and he makes people know that anyone who thinks that they're there because of their own might and power, God will bring them down. Uh, and then verse 31 in 2 Chronicles 32 says, Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of, of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him, referring to Hezekiah, God left him, 
to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. There are times where God is going to kind of take a step back and let us do whatever we're going to do. And he allowed everything to happen here with the Babylonians, with the ambassadors to come and, you know, and what he was doing, he's saying, I just wanted to see how he was going to respond. I want to know what's in his heart. Because it's one thing, and obviously God knows everything, but like we need to understand this concept. It's one thing for you to say how humble you are or say how much you love God or say how much, you know, you give God glory and everything else. And it's another thing when situations actually come up to do it, to, to, to be it and, and to, to do what's right. And, you know, when you have times that you feel like God's not there, sometimes it's a really rough time. Now, this wasn't a rough time for Hezekiah. If things were going well, he just got healed. He got people bringing him gifts, right? So things are going well, yet it was still a trial. It was still a test of God to say, even at your best of times, are you willing to humble yourself and say, you know what? God still gets the credit and the glory for this in this great miracle and everything that's happened. Praise the Lord. Right? That's one type of test, and you ought to be ready for that. Don't let yourself get lifted up and think that it's all you and, oh, things are going so great. It's me, 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 me. But then on the other hand, there's other trials that you may face. There's difficult trials where things are not going good at all, and it seems like everything is gone from you. That also could be a trial, and even when it might feel like God's not there, because the Bible says here God left him to try him. Right? He just wanted to see how he was going to respond. I believe that God did the same thing with Job. God left him temporarily for a while just to try him, just to see how is Job going to respond to this. When he loses everything, after I've blessed him so much, is he still going to retain his integrity? I mean, that's what Satan was acu falsely accusing him of, that he wouldn't, but he did. Job was tried through that difficult trial. He, I, we know for a fact that he was kind of wondering where God was through all of it. You know, he wasn't blaming God, but he, all these bad things were happening. He didn't quite understand it, and, and he was definitely having a hard time with it, and I'm sure he felt like God left him and everybody else left him, even though he maintained his faith. But we need to understand and remember that he'll never utterly leave us or forsake us. Even if he doesn't seem to be there for temporarily for a time, the hardest thing to do, but we need to remember this, and we're pre I'm preaching it now for this reason, is that maybe you're not going through anything difficult right now, but you might one day. And when you do, just remember that you might be being tried, and you need to try to pass that test and know that it's still only temporary. Make sure that your actions that when God tries you, your actions are going to show your faith. They're going to show your humility. They're going to show your integrity. They're going to show your dedication and your faith in the Lord. Hezekiah failed this test because he is lifted up with pride. And there is a result. There is a negative impact, a negative result because of his failing of that test because he didn't give God the credit, because he didn't uh, do what was right ultimately. Now, that doesn't make Hezekiah a bad guy. He's still known as a, as a great man of God, as a great king, you know, and, and someone who's good, but he has a failing here. And he does repent. We're going to see that in, in just a minute. But um, the, the, the trials are, are key points in our life the most important times when things get rough, especially to make sure that you can stick with it and not fail the test. Stay with it because it's only going to be temporary. And when, if you could come through those trials and make it through like Job did, you will be blessed and you're going to come through, you know, like gold, like silver, where it really tries you, but it also will end up strengthening, strengthening you in the end and purging some of the dross and the other things that have been part of your life up to that point. And you go through something really difficult, and if you could see it through to the end, you're going to come through way better and way stronger than when you went in to begin with. And we need to remember that and keep the faith of knowing the end result and not quitting and not failing. You know what? We're going through a trial in our church right now. 
but I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. We're being tried. I think we're being tried. I think God, you know, if nothing else, maybe God's testing me. I don't know. Maybe certain things are being allowed to happen to test me. You know what? My resolve is I'm going to do what God has for me to do. And that's all I can do. But I'm not going to doubt. I'm not going to say, oh, I wonder, I wonder if this was really a good idea to start a church. Or oh, I wonder what, you know, doesn't matter. It's not my responsibility to build a church. It's God. I'm going to do what's right. No, whether we grow, whether we shrink, no matter what happens, no matter who shows up, I'm going to do what I believe God has for me to do. And I don't think there's anything against God's will for, for pastoring a church and soul winning and doing everything that we're doing here. And I'm going to do it. And, I'm, and, and know this, that, that if this is a trial, I'm going to make sure that, that, that I come through good. And hopefully you can do the same thing. And, and we all face our own personal trials, but remember to, to stay strong and maintain that faith and come through to the end. Verse number 33 in Second Chronicles 32 says, And Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the chiefest of the sepulchres of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did him honor at his death, and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. Hezekiah was a man of great honor, even among the people. He had respect with God and with man. He did a lot of great things. Unfortunately, though, it appears that, that I think he cared a little bit more about that, about his honor and about his reputation and about doing all of these great things than he did about his own son. Let's keep reading back in 2 Kings chapter 20. We'll finish up this chapter. Verse number 19, the Bible says, Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, and look at this attitude that he has, because remember, he was just told that they were going to be taken captive. All the, 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 everything that he showed unto the Babylonians, he's going to lose. You know, all this bad stuff is going to happen. But then he's told, and I guess it's not in 2 Kings. I'm trying to think if it's here. Because he rep Hezekiah repents then. Yeah, because in verse 19, it says, Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? So basically what happens is that the judgment is spoken against Hezekiah from the Lord. You're going to be taken captive. All the wealth is going to be taken out. You know, you screwed up and this is what's going to happen. Hezekiah gets upset by this. He repents. And then God sees his heart. And this isn't another reference. So it's either in 2 Chronicles or it's in Isaiah. But um, he sees his heart. And I don't have it in my notes. And, and that's my fault for not having it here. But... Um, you could look it up for yourself where it says this. And God postpones the judgment. He says, well, it's not going to be in your days. So this is, again, where God listens to, to Hezekiah. He, see, he sees his heart. He sees him getting right with God and, and, and humbling himself. Right after he's just been judged for his pride, he humbles himself. God says, all right. You know, I, I see that you've gotten right with me because ultimately that's what God wants, right? He wants us just to get right with him. Even when we screw up, he wants you to get right and he extends mercy and says, all right, since you got right with me, it's not going to come in your days. It is going to come, but it's just not going to happen in your days. And, but look at Hezekiah's attitude. And I think this is a little bit telling is one of the flaws of Hezekiah. He says, and he says, is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Basically, well, you know, the, the, the word of the Lord's good because, hey, at least, at least the bad stuff isn't going to happen while I'm here. And basically, it's kind of like nuts to the next generation, right? As long as things are going well while I'm here, then everything's good. And not a care to what's going to happen in the future. And this is, 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 a, is a very, very destructive attitude to have. Now, we see that he was very honorable. We see he did all his works. Look at verse number 20. It says, And the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might 
and how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Hezekiah slept with his father, some nasty son reigned in his stead. He did a lot of great things. He did a lot of works. He was busy getting his pool going. He was busy getting the infrastructure set up in Jerusalem. He was busy fighting these battles. He was busy doing everything else. But you know what he wasn't busy doing? Raising his son. He didn't care about the next generation saying, well, if, if peace and truth be in my days, then everything's good. And not having the vision of the future and taking care of his sons. And this is probably the biggest failing of Hezekiah. And we need to remember and take note of this, that you can be a great Christian. You can do a lot for the Lord. But you better make sure that you're being a good parent. That you don't get so swept up and, over, and, and, and caught up in doing all of these other works that you let your own family go to hell. Manasseh was, you know, Hezekiah was one of the greatest kings. Manasseh was one of the most wicked kings out of the kings of Judah as well as the kings of Israel. And we're going to get into Manasseh next week and you're going to see all the garbage that he did in rejecting the Lord, child sacrifice, everything wicked came out of Hezekiah's own son because he didn't have the proper attitude to train up his own child and he was too busy doing everything else. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We need to take, make a, uh, our children a priority. Now look, serving God is a priority in our life. It is. We have to serve God. Actually, God should be first. Our relationship with God is first priority in, in every individual's life. But our children, your children, they're high on that list of priorities. Okay? And just because God is first in our priority list doesn't mean that we don't have other obligations and that other people are just not a priority at all. We need to balance our life out to, yes, serving God. Yes, serve God with our whole heart. Yes, put in a lot of time and energy and effort to serving the Lord and to doing other work and working for everyone, doing those things. But we cannot neglect our children. It's not an option. If you're married, you can't neglect your wife or your husband. If you have children, you can't neglect your children just because you're off doing something else. We need to recognize the value and the importance of, of our children and that it's not just about what it's not just about what you can do in your time here you also need to be influencing other people so that they can continue on and have a vision for the future I have a vision for my children to serve the Lord and I want them to be able to do even more and greater and mightier things than I could ever do and if and if they're raised properly they can do that they can have the best heads they can have the head start that I never had they can do so much more, but you have to have that vision and you have to invest the time. It has to happen. It doesn't happen on its own. I think Hezekiah got too caught up in everything else and he was granted even more time. God gave him extra years on his earth. But here's what's really interesting about that. After God listened to his prayer, consider this. Look at the next verse, the first verse of chapter 21. We're going to be going into next week. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. So after Hezekiah died, Manasseh began to reign. He was only 12 years old. Do you know what that means? He was granted 15 years to live. He was born after he would have died. In the 15 years that God granted Hezekiah on this earth, Manasseh was born in that time frame. Had Hezekiah died, when God was going to take him home, when God felt like his time was over and, and ready to, and, and if he would have gotten his house in order, this wicked Manasseh would have never been born. But think about this then too. He was born. What was Hezekiah doing? He was lifted up with pride. He was not right with God. God gave him a gift of extra years in his life. And what did he do with that? God blessed him with a child three years after that. But how did he raise him? 
Not at all. He didn't raise him at all. Because if he would have trained up his child in the way he should go, I believe the Bible when it says, when he's older, you shall not depart from it. He did not train up his child in the way he should go. And we'll see next week all about Manasseh and all the wickedness that he does because he starts doing it right away. He's 12 years old. Think about a 12-year-old child. How wicked do they have to be already at 12 to start doing the things that Manasseh got into? And that shows Hezekiah was not doing his job. We need to do the best, um, you know, give God the credit for the great successes in our life. Keep ourselves humble. And don't waste the gifts that God gives us. I mean, it's kind of like Hezekiah just threw it all away. He was given 15 years. 15 years he was healed and ends up bringing this judgment upon, upon himself and all Jerusalem. And Manasseh, this, this wicked son, is born and, and he basically just wasted everything that God had done for him. He lived a great life, did a lot of great things for the Lord, but then he finished miserably. I mean, God even listened to him to spare him from death and gave him 15 years and he wasted it. He wasted it. We don't see any other victories. We only see failures in that last 15 years that he had. You would think, or I would think, that those would be the best years because you've been given like a, a second chance. And you know what? When you get saved, when you, when you got saved, you were given a second chance. What are we doing with that life that God has given to us? Always blowing it and wasting it and, and not doing what we're supposed to be doing and just, just getting all caught up in ourselves and wrapped up in ourselves and all our own personal things and personal life and, and my own entertainment. I'm going to go off and just live in the world and do everything else in the world and not do anything for God and just waste the gift that God has given me? Or am I going to use it and be thankful and be gracious. God, you gave me 15 years. God, you gave me eternal life. How much better is eternal life than 15 years? So God, I'm not going to waste what you've given me. You, you paid the ultimate price. I won't waste it. Let's say tonight, I'm not going to waste that gift. When I'm tried, when it feels like God's not there, I'm going to stay through because I got that gift. Because I'm not going to waste it. I'm not going to turn my back on God. I'm not going to going to be foolish. I'm not going to get off in this world. I'm not going to backslide. I'm not going to get out of church. I'm not going to get out of anything. I'm going to stay right where I'm at because God is worth it and his love for me is worth it and the gift that he's given us, I'm not going to waste it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your great words here and for the great truths that are so timeless, Lord, that it doesn't matter when this book was written or penned down on, on any type of paper, dear Lord that uh, it's timeless and that we can, can gain very valuable lessons from your words. God, I pray that you please open up our understanding, Lord. Help us to be strengthened, to be edified into serving you and to, and to doing what you have for us to do, dear Lord. I pray that you would please bless our church. I pray that you please bless our members, Lord. Help us to get through the trials in our own personal lives and, and um, collectively as a church, Lord. Help us to just keep pushing through. And uh, we're going to remain faithful unto you, Lord, and we know that you're faithful to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.